Hello everyone! The Guardians have been around for quite some time, and even though Medivh's novel was called The Last Guardian, there's still one on Azeroth, even though we never hear about him. But who are the Guardians, and why do we need them? That's what we're going to find out. I want to cover most of the information that we know, so we'll probably take a couple of videos, but let's just begin and see how far we can go, shall we? To understand the Guardians, we'll first have to go back and look at how the first humans became mages. Way back when, around 10,000 years ago, the Night Elves and the Highborn had their Well of Eternity, from which they drew their magical powers. They did this without caring about the consequences, and it drew the attention of the Burning Legion. Sargeras himself showed up, and Queen Azara wanted to summon him into our world, so that Sargeras could destroy everything and reshape the world into perfection. She then envisioned ruling the world together with Sargeras, but things didn't go exactly as planned. Several races, and even the demigods and the dragon aspects, they teamed up to fight the Burning Legion, and in the end they managed to destroy the portal. This also caused the Well of Eternity to implode, and the land of Kalimdor to split apart. Illidan, the well is out of control! Aye, it's been twisted and turned by too many spells. The fuss we, especially you, made with the portal was too much. The same spell that sent the Burning Legion back into their foul realm now works on the well. It's devouring itself and taking its surroundings with it. Fascinating, isn't it? Not if we're caught up in it. Why weren't you running? What have you been doing with your hand in the well? Illidan Stormrage was not a highborn, but he did use magic, and before the well imploded, he scooped up some water and put it in several vials. He then used this water on top of Mount Hyjal to create a second well of eternity. The Night Elves, they just lost everything because of reckless use of magic and now another well was created. They first wanted to execute Illidan on the spot, but his brother Malfurion pleaded for him and instead they imprisoned him for life. Several Highborn did not agree with Queen Ajara's choices and they joined the resistance before she was defeated. The Night Elves they accepted the Highborn, but as you can imagine, they didn't want another War of the Ancients or a Sundering. So using arcane magic became a crime punishable by death. Dathramar Sunstrider was the one who led the Highborn away from Ajara and he wasn't happy about this. Magic was their birthright, they had been studying it for millennia and they weren't about to give it up. The Night Elves, they just couldn't execute all of them so they banished them instead and the Highborn moved away from the Night Elves across the sea past the newly formed Maelstrom all the way to the Eastern Kingdoms. They didn't leave empty handed, before they set sail they made sure to take one of Illidan's vials full of water from the original Well of Eternity. It was around this time that they started to call themselves High Elves and they first moved to the Tirasfall Glades. But after a few years many of them were driven insane. They believed that something evil was under the Glades, we're not sure what, but they believed something evil so they picked up their things and continued their journey. Along the way, they encountered the first primitive humans, but they didn't really interact with each other, while they also met the forest trolls of the Amani Empire, and they didn't get along with each other. The High Elves would soon start to hate the trolls, and the trolls didn't like them either. Eventually they found a place that was perfect for them, and they built their kingdom of Quelphalus. Unfortunately, they built this kingdom right on top of a sacred and ancient city of the trolls, and this just fused the hatred between trolls and high elves even further. They became enemies, the trolls started to attack their city, and the high elves managed to defend it with the use of magic. By using the vial full of water from the Well of Eternity, they created their own well, and they called it the Sun Well. For thousands of years they lived in their city, practiced their magic, but they were careful about not attracting the attention of the Burning Legion. In the meantime, the humans started to band together. The trolls were also a problem for them and it was Foradin of the Arafi who came up with a plan to unite all the different human clans. They did this by defeating the other clans and then offering them peace and equality. So what they did pretty much was kick the crap out of other clans and then just offer them a safe haven. They eventually built their capital city called Strom and founded their first human kingdoms called Erafor. 
The Amani Empire was huge, the biggest empire on the Eastern Kingdoms at the time and the High Elves they were losing their war. Something had to be done, so they sent one of their people to talk to the humans and see if they could form an alliance. Foradin was wise and he saw that letting the Elven Kingdom fall could mean their own defeat, so they agreed to team up. In exchange for the humans' troops, the High Elves would teach 100 humans the way of magic. The Elves found that although humans were initially clumsy in their handling of magic, they possessed a star startling natural affinity for it. 100 men were taught the very basics of the elves' magical secrets, no more than was absolutely necessary to combat the trolls. High elves and humans clashed with the trolls, and the trolls would eventually lose this war and never truly recover from their defeats. <laughs> the Amani never give up. We never forget. We never die. So at this point, humans could wield magic now, but the magi felt like the laws of Strom were holding them back, so they split themselves away from the kingdom and they built their own city, namely Dalaran. A city where they would be free to study, practice and use their magic as they pleased. More and more magi moved to Dalaran and soon enough, those who couldn't wield magic, but did provide food or drinks or other services, they too moved to Dalaran. All was good for a time until they learned the dangers of magic used on check, the lesson the High Elves learned so many years ago. The constant and ungoverned use of magic began to tear the fabric of reality around the city. These tears sent bright beacons out into the twisting nether, drawing the attention of the Burning Legion. Through these rents, demons began to slip back into Azeroth and the Magi consulted the High Elves about this problem. The High Elves told them that as long as they used magic, they would need to protect their people from the agents of the Burning Legion. The people couldn't find out about this, or else they would riot in fear, so they decided to create a secret order known as the Council of Tirisfall, named after the location where they would meet, the Tirisfall Glades. The order began to experiment as to how to best protect themselves from the demons. Some believed that they should work together as a team of equals, while others believed they should funnel their magic into a single being and let him or her be the shield. Although, they didn't exactly know how to do that. This finally brings us to how the first Guardian came to be. This story is set 260 years before the first war between orcs and humans. The Council of Tirisfall is formed and Irten Brighthand was their spearhead. He was the one that the other council members would link with, offer their powers and allow him to battle the demons. The problem with this method was that if one would fall or weaken, it would affect all of them so the weakest chain could make them all fall. In the story, a dreadlord has found his way into Dalaran and they come up with a plan to lure him into a trap using the Amulet of Water. The plan works perfectly, except that this is no ordinary dreadlord. This is Kafranatir, a dreadlord killed during the War of the Ancients by Malfurion Stormrage himself. The council tries to banish the demon, linking their power with Ertin, but it isn't enough. Kafranatir manages to land a strike against the undead mage Meryl, who was so focused on lending his powers that he couldn't defend himself. With Meryl down, the others are weakened, and Kafra was about to kill them all. A young student of Dalaran, Alodi, sees all of this going on, sees how they're all connected and linking their powers into one. His friends, Prince Nalorov, and his fiancée Idre can't even see this, but he does and he steps in to protect all of them. Desperately, he wants to protect as well as attack, and Ertin offers his powers to Alodi. This allows Alodi to create a shield strong enough to deflect Kafra's attacks, and his as soon as the demon touches his shield, it creates a huge explosion. All of them might have died that day from the uncontrolled powers, but Ertin used his last of his strength to absorb most of the impact and save them all. The next day, Alodi wakes up and Master Metal tells him what happened. Metal used to be a human, but he died during the Troll Wars. People still needed him, so he used his own magic to resurrect himself and keep himself alive. The demon was defeated for now, but definitely not vanquished, and he got his hands on the Amulet of Water, and with it he could corrupt Lordemare Lake. The council came together within Tirisfall Glades to discuss what to do next. Indus, a female gnome, told them that they had to select a new spearhead, but this wasn't so simple. Ertin possessed unique qualities, the skill to wield their linked power, the desire to defend, while also the wisdom to never turn against them. 
A Filar, a high elf female, suggested that they should just stop with trying to use this spearhead. They weakened themselves and all their spearheads so far had died. She saw it as a failing plan. Metal said that they already had found their new spearhead. Elodie had managed to wield their power purely by instinct with a desire to protect all of them and the heart of a warrior longing to use it as a weapon. He suggested that Elodie was their guy but the other members did not agree. They saw him as a high elf orphan, surely gifted but also lazy and unexperienced. Despite that, Meryl took the boy under his wing knowing that if he gave him a reason to excel, he definitely would. The boys studied hard and together with Meryl they worked on an improvement of the spell that they used to link with each other. This spell would allow them to link but over a much greater distance. That way the source of power could stay in a protective place while the spearhead would fight and protect. All this studying took up nearly all of Elodie's time and his fiancée was not happy about this. Elodie's needs and wishes had changed while hers had not and they were slowly growing apart. Several weeks later, the Dreadlord was spotted in Silver Pine, and the council tried to stop him by using their magic individually. This failed horribly, they couldn't even penetrate his magical wards, while the demon summoned a great swarm of locusts and tried to burn the council. Most of them survived, but one of them had a great fear of bugs, Aphilar, which caused her to freeze up and she was unable to protect herself. Again Meryl told them that they needed their champion and this time, seeing how Elodie has been working so hard, the council agreed. Elodie was invited to their secret meeting within the Tearsfall Glades where the council explains who they were and what they were offering him. Becoming the Spearhead wasn't something you just did, it would change you and your destiny forever. So Elodie couldn't immediately decide. He wanted some time to think and in that time he talked to his fiancée. She just received news that her father passed away. Her mother was ill, the land was beset by swarming insects and vermins, while the wells had run dry. All of this was the work of the Dreadlord and Elodie realized that he could save them all. He could protect the one he loved most, but in exchange he would have to let her go. Which he would of course. That night the council got together and Elodie told them his decision. But instead of directly linking to each other and only giving a portion of their power, he wanted them to offer all their power for the duration of the fight. They would use the spell that he and Meryl had been working on, the one that would allow them to link from a great distance so they wouldn't have to worry about protecting themselves. To reflect this change he would no longer be called their spearhead, instead he would become their guardian. Guardian of their power their safety and their trust, guardian of the defense of Azeroth. Metal, Yuga, Indus, Rohar and Irar offered their powers willingly. Power we have, power we share, out of many into one. Elodie made his way to Brightwater Lake where Kavranatir was last seen. He knew that the Dreadlord was not just trying to corrupt the lake or spread a plague, he had a larger plan. The plan to put High Elf, Human and Gnome against each other, so to cause wars which demons find so entertaining. Kavra was not impressed by the mage, they tried to contain it before, banish him, and they had failed. What difference would this one mage make? What he didn't know was that Elodie didn't come alone, and he used Indus' spell of bright vision to spot Kavra's aura of darkness. He used Yuga her spell to entrap Kavra within a magical ward. He asked Irar to lend him his strength so he could keep the ward active. He asked Meryl to share his courage so he could either face down this monster or accept his own death bravely. Then he asked all of them to combine their power and unleash every searing spell that they possessed so that they could banish this demon. This demon that had cost them so much, land destroyed, people killed and Elodie's life as he knew it, gone. This demon had turned him into a demon's nightmare and at the end of their struggle Elodie banished Kafra back to the Twisting Nether. His fiancée lived near the lake, saw everything that happened and realized that Elodie had saved her, had saved all of them. Their duties were no longer the same, where she would have to stay behind and take care of her family and their land, Elodie was destined to take care of the world. Once more Elodie tapped into the power of the council. Rohar, lend me your wisdom that I may do what is right and with that Elodie flew away from the love of his life and the life that he had known. He wanted to return his power to the rest of the council until the next battle, but they decided that he should keep it. When his time came, he would pass it on to the next guardian who would take his place as defender of the world, with the council backing him up. This went on for centuries where the guardian and the council worked in harmony. 
When Elodie's time was over, he passed on his powers to the next guardian. It's uncertain how many guardians defended Azeroth over the years, but what we do know is that at one point, Skevel became a guardian, and the guardian received the honorful title of Magna which means protector in Dwarven. This story takes place around 882 years ago and Magna Skevel's time was approaching, so he had to pick a new guardian from his five apprentices. Four of these apprentices, they were men. Falric, Jonas, Manfred and Natali, while Edwin was the only female. Back then, the social standing between males and females was not the same as it is today. Usually, females were taught to be pretty, learn skills like cooking or how to use herbs for healing. Basically, they got ready for a husband, but not something as independent as learning how to be a mage. Despite that, Edwin had become Skevel's apprentice and she was the most gifted. She had managed to master the Metri scrolls, which were scrolls made by a powerful high elven mage thousands of years ago and not even the High Elves were able to master these until decades into their apprenticeships. This is the reason why Skevel recommended Edwin for being the next Guardian. The other boys, the other apprentices, they thought that this was a stupid choice. That she was good for a woman, but they were men and true mages. Even the Council said the following. It is true, an older human said with a sigh, that women are emotional and prone to excessive displays that are unbecoming of a mage. But it is also true that Edwin has the most potential of any of the youths that Skeffel has found. And we cannot afford for the Guardian to be anything less than the best, even if that means giving the position to a girl. At that, Edwin bristled. With respect, good sirs, I will be as good as a mage as any of these boys. In fact, I think I would be better, because I had to overcome so much more to get here. The boys were still not happy. One of them tried to convince the council to pick him by turning stone into gold, but his spell failed and the council had decided. Besides, the older human added, the guardian must be the vessel of the council. I suspect that a girl will be less willful and will understand the chain of command, as it were. Now, as you can imagine, this wasn't exactly a great start for the new guardian and the council. But nonetheless, Edwin received Skevel's powers and took his place as the new guardian of Azeroth. Spells that used to take all her concentration now only took the briefest of thoughts and she became incredibly powerful. They informed her about her mission, of course, defending the world against the demons, and she performed her duty. One day, a demon named Smotlor took over the school in the small village of Yortas. By accident, Edwin spotted his demonic magic, stepped in, killed him and saved the children. She was then summoned by the council, who were not happy about her methods. She should have contained the demon instead of outright destroying him, so that they could use him for some information about Sargeras. Edwin couldn't believe it. What was she supposed to do? Just let the children be used? Killed even? She was fed up with the council their methods of being reactive instead of proactive. All they did was trying to react to the demonic threat while Asian believed that they should actively seek them out. The council reminded her that she was supposed to do as she was told, that the guardian was the arm of the council and that she should follow their orders. Aeswin at this point was exhausted after all that fighting and all she wanted was to get some sleep, so she asked the council if there was anything else and teleported away to the Violet Citadel. Instead of letting time take its course, Edwin decided to use her magic to keep herself from aging. The council would change over time, some would die and be replaced, even her former fellow students passed away, but Edwin didn't care about any of that. She believed the council to be a bunch of fools and she was the one who did all the work. This ego would become even bigger when she faced off against Sargeras, 500 years after she became the Guardian. In Northrend, demons were hunting dragons, and Edwin teleported to deal with them. She sent a massive bolt of power, which struck the banner carrier of the demons, the one who held the severed head of a green dragon. This drew the attention of several demons, but they were no match for Edwin's power. The leader of the group told her that she was a fool. While she had been fighting with just a few of them, many more had been summoned down below. You are an overconfident fool, screamed the demon. All have come here while you have fought these few. I know, said Edwin calmly. You know, bellowed the demon with a throaty laugh. You know that you are alone in the wilderness with every demon raised against you. You know? I know, said Edwin. And there was a smile in the voice. I know you would bring as many of your allies as possible. A guardian would be too great of a target for you to resist. And you came anyway, alone, 
to this forsaken place. I know, said Edwin, but I never said I was alone. Edwin snapped her fingers and the sky suddenly darkened as if a great flock of birds had been disturbed and blocked the sun. Except they were not birds, they were dragons. Edwin had lured as many demons as possible and the demons fell right into her trap. The dragons combined with the guardian nearly wiped out all the demons present, but a few of them managed to summon the avatar of Sargeras. This was not the real fully powered Sargeras since that would have taken a much larger portal with a lot more power. Nonetheless, even the avatar was incredibly powerful and a few remaining dragons quickly flew away. Edwin raised both hands and unleashed a shout, half curse and half prayer. A flaming rainbow of colors unseen on this world erupted from her palms, snaking upwards like a sentient strike of lightning. It struck like a dagger thrust in the center of Sargeras' chest. This attack took nearly everything that Edwin had and it was successful as well. Even though Sargeras tried to undo her spell, he didn't succeed and his avatar was destroyed. Edwin's trap had been more successful than even she had imagined, but what she didn't know was that this was exactly what Sargeras had planned all along. His spirit was not destroyed and he infected Edwin's body, hiding away until the day would come where he would be able to infiltrate the council from within and destroy Azeroth's defenses against the Burning Legion. Edwin didn't notice, of course. She thought that she just defeated the leader of the Burning Legion himself, a freaking god, and this just made her more arrogant. She locked away the avatar of Sargeras within the tomb of Sargeras and protected the place with such powerful defenses that no magic from Azeroth could ever break open the tomb. After that moment, after defeating Sargeras, Edwin resumed her duties as the Guardian while pretty much ignoring the council as much as she could. Around 107 years ago, the council had enough. They had summoned her several times already, which she ignored of course, but this time the summon was so powerful that it actually interrupted her own spellcasting. She showed up and the council told her that enough was enough. It's been 800 years since she first became the guardian and it was time to pass on her powers. Time for the council to select a new guardian. The magic she used to keep herself young was unstable, unreliable, and if she ever lost concentration, she could instantly turn to a real age and her powers would be lost. For once, she agreed with the council's suggestion, but she wasn't about to hand over the powers back to the council. As a final act of defiance, she told them that she would be the one to select a new guardian. She traveled to Stormwind to the home of Nilas Aran, and Nilas was a very powerful mage who served the current king of Stormwind, Landon Rin. He was also not tied to the council of Tereshval, which made him the perfect candidate to father her child. She let him believe that he was able to seduce her, tame the wild guardian, while in truth she was the one using him. But if you weren't impressed, said Nilas, his mind wrapping around what Adrian was saying, if you didn't want me, then why did we... Edwin provided the answer. I came to Stormwind for one thing I could not provide for myself. A suitable father to my heir. Yes, Nilas Aran, you can tell your fellow mages in the Order that you managed to bet the great and mighty guardian. But you will also have to tell them that you provided me with a way of passing on my power without the Order having any further say in it. And take this solace of all the mages, wizards, conjurers and sorcerers, you were the one with the most potential. Your seed will protect and strengthen my child and make him the vessel for my power. And when he is born and weaned, you will even raise him here, for I know he will follow my path. And even the Order would not want to miss that opportunity to influence him. And so the next guardian was created, namely Medivh, which means keeper of secrets in High Elven. Edwin placed the powers inside of him and left him with Nilas Aran so he could raise him and teach him. For his own protection, she stayed out of Medivh's life in case her enemies would find out that he was her child. Little did she know that the true enemy in this case was her own arrogance. In her desire to poke in the council's eye just one more time, she had created a vessel in which the spirit of Sargeras could manifest. The the perfect pawn which could infiltrate the council and weaken Azeroth's defenses against the Burning Legion. Medivh grew up 
together with Anduin Lothar and future King of Stormwind Lane Rin. His powers, as well as Sargeras, lay dormant within him until he came of age. His powers unleashed abruptly and Sargeras awakened within him. His father tried to help him, but in the end he died and Medivh was in a coma for 20 years. We later find the spirit of Aran in Karazhan and apparently he's been tortured probably by Medivh or by Sargeras, we're not sure, but somehow his spirit ended up in Karazhan. Please, no more! My son, he's gone mad! I'll not be tortured again! At last, the nightmare is over! Enduin Lothar watched over Medivh, and one day Medivh just woke up again and resumed his life. Not all the details about what he did in the time period are clear, but what we do know is that Medivh took up residence within the Tower of Karazhan. All the while battling with Sargeras inside of him, and slowly but surely, Sargeras managed to take him over. Around that time, the orcs' homeworld of Drenor was corrupted, and Kil Jaden had left them to their fates. These orcs were perfect for Sargeras' plan, since they could keep the world busy and weaken it so that the Burning Legion could come and conquer the planet. He contacted Gul'dan and told him about Azeroth, a world with water, food, plenty of things to kill, and he also told him that he would be rewarded with power. Power waiting for him within the tomb of Sargeras. Remember that Adrian protected the tomb with magic from Azeroth. No magic on Azeroth could ever open the tomb. Gul'dan was from Drenor, and so his magic would be able to. The pact was made. Gul'dan and his orcs built the dark portal on Drenor, while Medivh made the portal on Azeroth and unleashed the orcs upon the world. Aegwyn found out about this and she paid a visit to her son in Karazhan. There are two versions of this encounter that describe what happened and they both tell it in a different way. But the essence is that Medivh had killed the council and she figured out that Sargeras was inside her son. That she had been an arrogant fool and instead of doing better than the council, she actually had opened the way for the demons to take over Azeroth. She weeped in that moment. She didn't weep when her parents had died or when Medivh was born, but in that moment she cried and she wanted to die. In the novel Cycle of Hatred, she used her own magic to teleport herself away. This magic came from the spell that kept her young and while she teleported, this also aged her a little. In The Last Guardian, Medivh himself teleports her away since Sargeras is unable to actually kill her. Some part of Medivh prevents him from doing so, but either way, he didn't give her the sweet release of death and she would have to live with the knowledge of what she had done. The blue dragon Arcanagos also paid a visit to Karazhan, warning Medivh that he was attracting the attention of powers beyond his understanding and that a dark power wanted to use him. Medivh didn't listen, or perhaps Sargeras didn't care, Either way, he struck Arcanagus with such a spell so powerful that it burned him from within. Burned him and later turned him into Nightbane. This took so much power that Medivh had to go and rest. The Dark Riders, a group of mounted horsemen roaming the land in search of powerful artifacts, were also created by Medivh. They used to be merchants, foolish enough to try and sell fake magical artifacts to Medivh. You don't want to mess with a guardian, especially one affected by Sargeras, and as punishment he turned them into the Dark Riders. Now they're forced to collect real artifacts and bring them back to Karazhan. Now back to the main story, sometime after Medivh opened the Dark Portal, a young mage named Ketgar which means trust in Dwarven, is sent from Dalaran to become Medivh's apprentice. There have been several potential apprentices before, but most of them didn't last long, either because of divisions within the tower or because of Medivh himself. Medivh was rather eccentric. At one moment he could be as calm as day, the next moment it would almost seem as if a storm was raging within him. Khadgar didn't immediately start out as an apprentice, he first became Medivh's assistant and he was charged with cleaning up the library. Medivh immediately recognized him for what he was, a spy sent by the mages of the Kirin Tor to learn more about Medivh and the knowledge that he had. He didn't care about this, he was forthright about this, all open about it. He didn't care, not one bit, and he was willing to share all his information with Khadgar as long as Khadgar would first show him what he was sending away. Khadgar would eventually reach apprentice status and Medivh trained him in the ways of magic, turning him into a very skilled mage. More orcs were pouring through the dark portal every day, several mages were murdered and Enduin Lothar tried to get information out of Khadgar about Medivh. Lothar was Medivh's childhood friend and he had seen him fall into a coma. He was worried that Medivh might fall again and he wanted to know what Khadgar thought 
about his teacher. Kedgar felt so loyal to Medivh and didn't tell Lothar all the details, but he promised him that if anything would come up, he would tell him. In the meantime, Kedgar was practicing his magic and he was trying to summon the visions within the Tower of Karazhan. He had already received a couple of visions by accident. One of them showed an old man leading human troops on a planet with a red sky. No one in this vision could actually see Kedgar except for that one old man. They locked eyes and what he saw disturbed him greatly, for the old man's eyes were his eyes. Another accidental vision showed him Lothar Medivh and Lane in a forest. Trolls attacked their party and they defended themselves with weapons and magic. At the end of the vision, Medivh collapses and he says not to Lothar, not to Lane, but he says specifically to Gedgar, watch out for me. This got him very curious about these visions and he even talked with Medivh about them and Medivh told them that these visions come and go. That not all visions should be trusted, although up to this point, all visions have become a reality. This got him so curious that Kedgar started to work on a spell that would allow him to control them instead of seeing them randomly. In the meantime, the Orcish Horde had sent an emissary to talk with Medivh, to spy on him even, Gorona half Orcan. Kedgar didn't trust her at first, since he was an orc, but later they would battle the demon together you can't help but become friends with someone who's willing to fight with you. They also talked about Medivh, his trust in them, while also being so eccentric. They talked about the Horde, the portal that led them into Azeroth, Gul'dan, and that Garona was indeed a spy, but that she no longer wanted to betray Medivh because of his trust in her. She felt so conflicted about who to report to, and Medivh was so open with her, that she no longer wanted to betray him. Later we'll find out that there was even more going on between Garona and Medivh, but that's for next video. Either way, Garona was the one who came up with a plan to use Ketkar's vision spell and try to find out who opened the dark portal for the Horde. As they summoned the vision, they saw the following. Gul'dan was up on his knees, his hands clasped before him. I shall do so, for yours in power most supreme. But who are you truly? And how will we reach this world? The figure raised his hands to his hood and Ketkar shook his head. He didn't want to see it. He knew, but he did not want to see it. A deeply lined face, graying brows, green eyes that sparkled with hidden knowledge and something dangerous. Next to him, Corona let out a gasp. I am the guardian, said Medivh to the orc warlock. I will open the way for you. I will smash the cycle and be free. The time has come. Gul'dan, order your warlocks to double their efforts. Moments from now, the gateway will open, and your horde will be released upon this ripe, unsuspecting world. What they saw in that vision shocked them to their core. Medivh himself allowed the horde entry into the world. The real Medivh showed up, and Garona noticed two shadows behind him. Two shadows, one of Medivh and one of the real evil within him, Sargeras. They had to escape the tower and get some help, so Kedgar summoned a vision of the one who had battled this beast before, and the room changed around them, showing the moment where Agewin confronted her son and simply asked him why. Medivh, the real Medivh, was mesmerized by this vision, and they used this momentum to escape the tower, find Enduin Lothar, and return to Karazhan to stop the corrupted guardian. To stop the one who had allowed the orcs into Azeroth, who had murdered mages who were onto him, who had murdered the council itself. As they made their way into Karazhan, they found a hidden entrance leading down. They found out that there was an area beneath the tower which was the opposite to the tower above the grounds. Where above you would find a library, down below you would find a torture chamber. It was almost as if the tower reflected the two sides of Medivh himself. They found Medivh at the very bottom and they confronted him with what he had done. In that battle, Medivh attacked Kedgar and literally sucked the life out of him, making him look like the old man from the vision. He also touched Corona, transferring his emotions to her mind, his own divisions and doubts, which made her scream in torment and knocked her out for the rest of the fight. Lothar stepped up, attacking the mage with his blade and Medivh set his clothes on fire, claiming that it just got easier. In that moment of distraction, Kedgar was able to get close enough and he stabbed Medivh through the heart. In his final moments, Medivh said, Thank you. I fought it for as long as I could. Then the master's mage face began to transform. The beard turning fully to flame, the horn sprouting from his brow. With the death of Medivh, Sargeras finally came fully to the surface.
But before he could, Lothar raised his blade and chopped off his head. With that, Sir Garrus and Medivh were defeated. They buried his corpse outside of Karazhan and made their way to Stormwind, where Corona would become an advisor of the king and eventually betray him, just like she had seen in the final vision from Karazhan. Garona would disappear, Stormwind would fall, the people would evacuate to Lordaeron, and Lothar and Khadgar would warn the world of the Orcish invasion. After Lothar, Garona and Khadgar defeated Medivh, they moved to Stormwind and they tried to defend the city from the invading horde. Garona became an advisor for the king, but Gul'dan had placed a spell on her mind at a very early age and this spell would turn her into a slave, forced to do whatever they told her to do. They used this spell to force Garona to assassinate the king because, as he himself said, We will hold until the reinforcements come. As long as men with stout hearts are manning the walls and the throne, Stormwind will hold. Tremble, mortals, before the coming of the end. The York leaders agree with your assessment. With the king dead, Stormwind quickly fell. Enduin and Khadgar took the survivors and made their way to Lordaeron, while Garona disappeared. A very long story follows, so I'll have to keep it short. Basically, the horde was defeated and the orcs that surrendered were placed in internment camps. Baby Thrall was also found by Blackmore, who raised him as a slave and a gladiator, so Thrall could fight in his arena and earn him lots of gold. His ultimate plan was to use Thrall to lead the orcs against the rest of the world, so that Blackmore would become the ultimate ruler but his plan backfired. Thrall escaped, met his own people, and he freed the orcs from their internment camps. In the end, he killed the one who did him so much harm, Blackmore, and he reformed the horde, only this time it would be a more honorable horde, willing to fight for their own place in this world. Around this time, Medivh enters the story again, and you might wonder, how is that possible? Well, Agewin was not killed by Medivh. He only teleported away and she used her magic to see what was going on. And she saw how Medivh was defeated and how the spirit of Sargeras had left his body. She then spent years on collecting her powers and she used this to resurrect her son. This process nearly killed her, sapped her of nearly all her powers, but she did manage to bring back Medivh uncorrupted and ready to save the world from the coming threats of the Burning Legion. Sargeras might have been defeated, but his plans were already in motion. The world was weakened by the struggles between the Horde and the Alliance and the Burning Legion was about to begin their invasion of Azeroth. Before Medivh began his journey, he first paid a visit to Karazhan and that's the way the story of the Last Guardian is set up. It's that Medivh sees the visions of Karazhan. He sees what's happened in the past with Khadgar, with Lothar. That entire story is told by seeing it through these visions. At the end of the book, Khadgar of the past looks up and he sees Medivh of the future. Remember that past, present and future, they're pretty much fluid within Karazhan and they talk about the nature of the Guardian. The being on the balcony paused for a long moment and Khadgar feared that he would fade away. Instead he said, As long as there are guardians, there is order. And as long as there's order, the parts are there to be played. Decisions made millennia ago set both your path and mine. It is part of a greater cycle, one that has held us all in its sway. Khadgar craned his head upward. The sun was now touching the top half of the tower. Perhaps there should be no guardians then, if this has been the price. Agreed said the trespasser, and as the strong light of day began to grow, he began to fade. But for the moment, for your moment, we must all play our parts. We all must pay the price. And then, when we have the chance, we will start anew. And with that, the trespasser was gone. That was Medivh's mission throughout Warcraft 3. The Guardian could have stepped up and taken care of the Burning Legion himself, but Medivh had a different plan, and for that plan, he would need just a little bit more power. That power came from the Tower of Karazhan itself. He used his magic to absorb all the visions from the tower. Medivh held both hands to his chest tightly, containing all that he had regained. The Tower of Karazhan was just a tower now, a pile of stone in the remote reaches far from the travel paths. Now the power of the place was within him, and the responsibility to do better with it, this time. And so we start anew, said Medivh. He transformed into a raven with the mission to unite the world against the Burning Legion. To teach the world that it no longer needed guardians, that Azeroth could rise up and defend itself. He paid a visit to Thrall sometime after he had reformed the Horde. You must rally the Horde and lead your people to their destinies.
He paid a visit to the human kingdoms in King Ternus Manifield II. I will not institute quarantine without proof of your claims, Ambassador. The people of Lordaeron have suffered enough without becoming prisoners in their own lands. Yet, prisoners they are, good king. What is the meaning of this? Who are you? Humanity is in peril. The tides of darkness have come again, and the whole world is poised upon the brink of war. Enough of this. Guards, remove this madman. Hear me. The only hope for your people is to travel west, to the forgotten lands of Kalendra. Old Ambassador, I don't know who you are or what you believe, but this is not the time for rambling prophets. Our lands are beset by conflict, but it shall be we who decide how best to protect our people, not you. Now, be gone! I failed humanity once before, and I will not do so again. If you cannot take up this cup, then I shall find another who will. They would not listen, so he tried to convince the Magi of Dalaran. You must be wiser than the king. The end is near. I told you before, I'm not interested in this nonsense. Then I've wasted my time here. He even tried to warn Arthas. Greetings, young prince. We must talk. I have no time for this. Listen to me. This land is lost. The shadow has already fallen, and nothing you do will deter it. If you truly wish to save your people, lead them across the sea, to the west. Flee! My place is here, and my only course is to defend my people. Then your choice is already made. Just remember, the harder you strive to slay your enemies, the faster you'll deliver your people right into their hands. But there was only one human willing to listen to him. The dead in this land might lie still for the time being. But don't be fooled. Your young prince will find only death in the cold north. You! Arthas is only doing what he believes is right. Commendable as that may be, his passions will be his undoing. It falls to you now, young sorceress. You must lead your people west to the ancient lands of Kalimdor. Only there can you combat the shadow and save this world from the flame. Jaina Proudmoore took the people of Lordaeron as many as she could. She took them away from the plague and she allied herself with Thrall and Cairn Bloodhoof. That voice. You're no oracle. You're the prophet. Very perceptive, son of Durotan. I am the prophet. And now that I have lured you all here, I will tell you what destiny holds. What the hell is going on here? Thrall, this is Jaina Proudmoor, leader of the survivors of Lordaeron. Survivors? What are you talking about? The invasion of the Burning Legion has begun. Lordaeron has already fallen, and now the demons come to invade Kalimdor. Only together, united against the Shadow, will you be able to save this world from the flame. Unite with them? Are you mad? Have you heard nothing that I've said? The Legion comes to undo history and end all life. Thrall, your friend Hellscream has already fallen under the demons' influence. Soon he and your whole race will be lost forever. No. I'll die before I let that happen. Then you must rescue him immediately. He is the key to the destiny I promised you. However, you will need help. Wait, this is insane. You can't possibly expect me destiny to- Destiny is at hand, young sorceress. The time to choose has come. For the fate of all who live, humanity must join forces with the Horde. 
They then teamed up with the Night Elves, Malfurion and Tyrande. We have no time for this, Furion. What are we doing out here? Last night in a dream, a great raven spoke to me and summoned me to this place. We were summoned here as well. Who are you, Outlanders? I am Throg, son of Durotang, war chief of the Horde. And I am Jaina Proudmoore, leader of the human survivors of Lordaeron. You are not welcome here. Peace, Priestess. They've come to aid you against the Legion. It was you in my dream. But who are you to make such an offer to us? I am the reason for the Legion's return. Years ago, I brought the Orcs into this world. And by doing so, I opened a path for the demons as well. For my sins, I was murdered by those who I cared for most. Despite my death, war raged across the lands of the East for many long years, leaving entire kingdoms devastated in its wake. Now, at long last, I have returned to set things right. I am the Deev, the last guardian. I tell you now, the only chance for this world is for you to unite in arms against the enemies of all who live. Humans, orcs, Torn and Night Elves, a strange alliance was formed, but it would prove to be strong enough to stand against the Legion, and even defeat one of their commanders, our command. The roots will heal in time, as will the entire world. The sacrifices have been made. Just as the orcs, humans, and night elves discarded their old hatreds and stood united against a common foe, so did nature herself rise up to banish the shadow. As for me, I came back to ensure that there would be a future. To teach the world that it no longer needed guardians. The hope for future generations has always resided in mortal hands. And now that my task is done, I will take my place amongst the legends of the past. And so ends the story of the Guardians. The protection of this world is now in the hands of mortals. Or so you would think. There is currently a new Guardian on Azeroth, Medan. But before we talk about Medan, let me first tell you what happened to Aedwin. After the alliance between Thrall, Jaina and the Night Elves, Thrall and Jaina decided to relocate to Kalimdor, 
where Jaina would build Fedamore and Thrall would build Orgrimmar. Old hatreds die very hard and the orcs and humans were having a hard time living in peace, even after Jaina sacrificed her own father. Thrall and Jaina, they did their absolute best to keep the peace going, but it wasn't easy and it almost looked like some external force was trying to manipulate events, trying to cause another war. One day, the forest around Thunder Ridge was removed by magic, which caused the Thunder Lizards to run rampant across the lands, destroying farms and causing all kinds of problems. Some orcs immediately blamed the humans, some were even suggesting that Jaina had something to do with this, but Thrall was wiser and he first wanted to find out what was going on. So he talked to Jaina and she promised him that she would take care of the situation. She planned on relocating the lizards to the Bladescar Highlands where they wouldn't cause any more trouble. When she tried to teleport the lizards away, something prevented her from doing so and it turned out to be magical wards, protecting the area from unwanted visitors. Jaina managed to locate the wards and inside she found Agewin. Agewin had always been a role model to Jaina, a female mage who cleared the way for other females who was accepted by the council and she really looked up to the Magna. Agewin just laughed at what Jaina told her and she explained bits and pieces of her true story. How arrogant she was, a fool for being manipulated by Sargeras, causing the first Orcus invasion, all of that story, everything she'd done wrong, Agewin felt guilty and a heavy burden on her shoulders. As they were talking, they felt that the magical wards around Agewin Place were reactivated, only this time they felt different. They could feel the magic behind them, and Agewin recognized it to be Smotlor's magic. Smotlor, the same demon Agewin defeated so many years ago in a school in the village of Yortas. All Agewin wanted to do at this point was to live out the rest of her days away from the rest of the world, just waste away in her own self-pity. But Jaina wouldn't let her. Despite all of Agewin's mistakes, she never stepped away from her duty. She might have been wrong, but her motivations were always for the good of the world. Now, all these events between orcs and humans, the burning blade cult, magical wars made by Smotlor, it all came together and Jaina knew that he was behind this. She brought Agewin with her and at the end of the story they find the demon who caused all this trouble. Jaina tried to use her own magic with a spell created by Agewin. This spell would allow them to banish Smotlor back to the Twisting Nether, but at this point Jaina was tired. She didn't have enough power to defeat him alone, so Agewin grabbed Jaina and poured all of that magical power that she had gathered into Jaina. Agewin continued to focus, willing her life, her magic, her very soul to Jaina Proudmoore. Jaina opened her eyes. Normally an icy blue, they were now a fiery red. Combining their power, they managed to defeat the demon and peace between Fedamore and Orgrimmar was restored at least for the moment. Agewin nearly gave her life, but she survived that moment and she became Jaina's Chamberlain, giving her advice and telling her when she was wrong. In her role as Chamberlain, she assisted Jaina in helping Varian Rin. Varian was split into two by Onyxia's magic and he was having trouble figuring out who he was and what had happened. Jaina and Agewin, they helped him with figuring out who exactly he was and told him that he was the King of Stormwind. So at this point, Jaina and Agewin are working together, Varian was able to fix himself, defeat Onyxia and save Anduin. It's at this point in the story that we meet Madan and there's so much going on, so many characters and different stories, that I'll have to do my best to keep it focused on Madan. Let's begin at the beginning. When Garona of Orkan was inside Karazhan, she met with Medivh and she grew to like him and trust him. In a moment where Sargeras' attention was elsewhere, Medivh managed to father a child with Garona, namely Madan. Medivh would eventually be defeated and Garona betrayed the king because of that mind spell placed by Gul'dan. She knew from that moment on that she couldn't take care of this child, not without putting his life in danger, so when he was born, she gave the child to Meryl, the same undead mage Meryl that was part of the first council. Meryl raised Medan while never telling him about his parents and Medan is a unique character, part orc, part Draenei, part human, and right at the start of the story, he's already able to wield the powers of a shaman, a mage, and he has the necessary skills to fight with a weapon. There's also a prophecy surrounding Madan which says the following. When the child of the three realms becomes as light, the ancient power will be released. The earth will tremble, the seas will rise up in answer, and all will be madness. A new day will dawn, bring with it chaos or peace. 
This prophecy found its way to Cho Gall, former student of Gul'dan, who now works for the old god Kafun. Kafun by this time is already defeated by us, but he's not killed, and Cho Gall plans to use Medan and this prophecy to resurrect the fallen old god and bring about the end of the world. So what happens to Medan? He's attacked by the Twilight's Hammer Clan in order of Cho Gall. Corona jumps out of a tree and she saves him, but she does get captured herself. Even though she was afraid to raise Madan, she couldn't just leave him to his fate and she always kept an eye on him. Corona is then taken to Ankirai, where Cho Gall awaits and he uses that mind spell to force Corona to attack Feramore. Cho Gall was Gul'dan's student, as close as an ally Gul'dan ever had, so he knew how to use that magic. They wanted Garona to attack Feramore, since at that moment a peace summit between the Horde and Alliance was taking place. Medan overhears Metal talking, and he finds out that Garona is his mother, and he goes after her while Garona attacks Feramore. Remember that it was Garona who killed Varian's father. He saw her do this as a child, and when he saw her Fedamore, he immediately accused the Horde of sending the same assassin after him. Garrosh took this very personal, and he blamed the Alliance for what was going on. Eventually, they managed to repel the attack, they nearly killed Corona, but Medan jumped in and saved her life. Medan then captured himself by the Twilight's Hammer Clan, while Corona is put in chains at Fedamore. This meant the end of any peace between the Alliance and the Horde. They didn't outright attack each other at that moment, but any negotiations were off the table. Each of them returned to their homes to eventually deal with the Lich King attacking Azeroth. Garona wanted to find her son, but there were spells placed on her mind blocking her from the truth. Jaina used her own magic to penetrate these blockades which caused Garona agonizing pain, but in the end they found the truth. Cho'Gal was in Ankirai, and that's where they would find Medan. Valera, together with Meryl, teleported to Ankirai in an attempt to save Medan. We'll do a story on Valera in the future, but what you need to know is that she met Varian while he was dealing with Onyxia. Onyxia wanted Varian dead, so she sent an assassin after him, and his warlock assassin placed a curse on Valera called the Mark of Kafranatir. For those who've been paying attention, Kafranatir is the same demon that the first guardian had to deal with. This mark placed the demon inside of her, and during her rescue attempt, she was forced to fight with Cho'Gal. Cho'Gal outpowered her greatly, so she accepted the demon inside of her. She accepted him taking over her body, if it would allow them to defeat Cho'Gal. Not even Kavranatir was powerful enough to defeat Cho'Gal, but it did buy them enough time to rescue Madan and teleport away. The demon tried to manipulate Madan, tried to take over his mind and body, but Meryl stepped in and made him an offer that he couldn't refuse. Exchange the body of Valera for Meryl himself. Now this ancient undead human also contained the spirit of Kavranatir, but Meryl was not just any mage and he was able to contain the demon, at least for the moment. Meanwhile, back at Fedamore, Corona is rescued by Vindicator Marad. Marad had found out that his sister's child was Corona, and it was actually a surprise for Corona herself. She always believed that she was half human and half orc, but Marad was positive that he was her uncle and that she had a major role to play against Jogal. Marad also met Medan and he taught him about the light and he did this to keep the whispers of Kafun out of Medan's head. He warned Medan that it would take years to truly master the light, but Medan instantly picked it up without any effort. Which meant that Medan was safe for the moment, and they all sat down to talk about what was going on. They figured out that Shogal and Kafun were a huge threat to the world, especially since the Horde and Alliance were dealing with the Scourge attacks. Meryl told them about the first Council of Tirisfall, how they came together, and funneled their powers into one. They decided that this was the way to go, that the Guardian had to return to battle against Kafun and Shogal. This time, they wouldn't just use Magi, this time, the council would consist of members from all kinds of magical origins. Druids, magi, priests, shamans, all of them combining their powers. As they worked on creating the council, getting the members ready, Medan took a trip with Marat to Outland, where he met Katkar and they talked about his father. Medan also received a vision from his father which summoned him to the Tower of Karazhan, but at first Medan didn't want to go. Most believed that Medivh was truly evil, but Katkar explained that Medivh was corrupted and he didn't really have a choice. This pushed Medan into going to Karazhan, where the avatar of Medivh was waiting for him. 
This wasn't the real Medivh, this was his avatar, a vessel with his powers and memories, and he told Medan his life story. At the end, he offers Medan his remaining powers to use freely in any way that Medan desires. Medivh had no intention of forcing his son into a destiny or future, just like he and his mother were. Medan had a choice, and he chose to take the fight to Tokal, to use his powers for good and for the defense of Azeroth. There were two things required for the final battle. First, a new council which would empower Medan, and those part of the council were the following. Jaina Proudmore, Human Mage. Dalinia Ravskar, Blood Elf Mage. Hamul Runetotem, Torrent Druids. Brawl Bear Mantle, Night Elf Druids. Marad, Draenei Paladin. Rohan, Dwarf Priest. And finally, Rhaegar Urfury, Orc Shaman. All these different sorts of power, they combined themselves with Medan. Power we have, power we share. Out of many, into one. Even with this incredible power boost, Medan wasn't able to defeat Cho Gaul, and the demon Kafr Nazir managed to shake off Metal's control and he followed the stream of power back to the council. Now the council had to deal with this demon instead of linking their power with Medan, and this left Medan weakened. Agewin at that moment stepped up to the plate and she sacrificed the last of her energies to empower her grandson, to buy the council enough time to restrain Kafr Nazir and relink themselves with Medan. After all her battles, nearly giving up her life several times, this time the end had come. She poured her love and her strength into her grandson, and Medan was able to hold off Cho Gaul, but he still was not able to defeat him. The second thing that Medan required was Aetius, Great Staff of the Guardian. This legendary staff was passed on from Guardian to Guardian, but it was shattered and only the bottom half somehow made its way into Cthulhu. Garona had recovered the base inside the corpse of Cthulhu, and after a long struggle, she brought it to Medan. As the base touched Medan, he used his powers to restore it to its former glory and finally end the threat of Jogal. Jogal's mission had failed. Cthulhu was not resurrected and the prophecy was fulfilled. When the child of the three realms, Drenor, Azeroth and Argus, becomes as light, the ancient power will be released. The earth will tremble, the seas will rise up and answer, and all will be madness. A new day will dawn, bring with it chaos or peace, and since the day was won, peace was found. Medan then returned his powers to the members of the council, and they buried Agewin next to Medivh at Karazhan. Garona had to leave her son again, because they might have stopped Shogal today, but he wasn't killed, and as long as he was alive, she was a threat to anyone around her. She would pursue Shogal all the way to the Twilight Highlands, where we could find her during the Cataclysm, but we would eventually be the ones who actually killed Shogal. The council, they broke up and they returned to their original roles within the Warcraft story. They haven't really mentioned the council or Medan ever since. There was a mention in Valen's short story about Medan, but other than that, we haven't seen it in game, we haven't seen it in the stories. Some of you asked me if I think that we'll ever see this character in game and why people hate the character of Medan. I can't speak for everyone, so you'd have to ask them what their problem is with his character. But for me, there are two things that stand out with Medan. First of all, he's just too damn powerful. He's a mage, a priest, a shaman, a warrior hybrid, and anything that he can't do, he'll just pick up within seconds. That's insane. And that's saying something for the Warcraft universe, since we already have insanely powerful characters like Varian Rin, who has a demigod watching over him and empowering him, or Thrall, who got equal to the aspects during the Cataclysm. Imagine them placing an even more powerful character within the game. There would be nothing left to do for anyone. Old God Trouble? Just send Medan. Sir is knocking on a door? Send Medan after him. I think even Blizzard recognizes this, because they have been asked several times whatever happened to Medan, and apparently he's off on a different world studying or protecting it. He's gone. Let's just put it like that. He's not on Azeroth, he's not in the story, and yeah, he's not around. The second thing that bothers me about Medan is that creating him pretty much destroyed what Medivh did during Warcraft 3. Remember that Medivh wanted to teach the world that it could take care of itself, break the cycle so that it no longer needed to have guardians. It had such a beautiful ending, with even a little bit of speculation about Medivh, whether or not he's still around. Now with Medan, they completely went back on that decision, and it makes what Medivh did back in Warcraft 3, it just makes it silly. He could have just stepped in, fight the Burning Legion himself, and hand over his powers to his son. His son that he was able to make while being corrupted by Sargeras. 
which is also pretty damn impressive. There are more reasons to dislike his character, but that's mainly my feeling behind it. And to the question, will we ever see him in-game? I highly doubt it. Will Medivh ever make a return? Well, not unless they declare this comic as non-canon. Medivh handed over his powers to Medan, so he should be powerless. He should be gone. In the novel Twilight of the Aspects, he makes a cameo as Thrall travels through time. But that wasn't the return of Medivh, so as much as I would love to see it, I doubt he will ever come back. Not unless they do some serious retconning. What we can hope for is that they give him a part in the World of Warcraft movie, because that would be pretty damn cool. A corrupted Medivh out there with Lothar and Duratan. I would love to see that, but we'll just have to wait and see what they're going to do. With that, I think I've been talking for long enough, which makes this the end of my video and the end of the story of the Guardians. Thank you very much for watching everyone. I hope you enjoyed the stories. Subscribe if you like my videos. And until next time guys, see ya. And now that my task is done, I will take my place amongst the legends of the past.